Hi everyone, welcome to another exciting video here in Physics uh, 144. Uh, today's topic is we're going to get into discussing dynamics. This is the second part of the dynamics unit, and the main thing that we're going to be focusing on here is different types of forces. So the Previous lecture covered kind of our basic forces, gravitational forces, normal forces, tension forces. Uh, here in this video, we'll be going over a couple different cases where we have special models for our forces. And those are friction, a fluid force, and then the spring forces. And then we'll talk about how those apply in the context of circular motion. So without further ado, let's get started with the friction forces. So friction forces arise whenever two surfaces interact. Uh, these are generally solid objects that we are seeing uh, uh, connect with each other. And at the microphysical level, what's happening with friction is uh, we have these two objects and in a very small level, uh, there's all these little bumps and wiggles, these imperfections that kind of create uh, the surface itself, and at the atomic scale, those are very rough. There's a bunch of atoms and small features going up and down, and these small features end up creating small polar regions in the uh, material. And polar here in the electrostatic sense, meaning that they have a sort of net charge by kind of shaping up and having nuclei from atoms push up in one direction, and those are kind of crunched together, so the electrons are forced away. And so there's a slight polarity to these, uh, these bumps and wiggles on the surfaces of the, uh, on the surfaces. And then when one surface slides against each other, those, uh, polar interactions electrostatically interact with each other, or they just have straight up normal force collisions, uh, like we discussed last time, where we have these electrostatic interactions there. Uh, friction is delightfully complicated. It's an incredible, di uh, incredibly difficult study to a uh, subject to study uh, because you know, you think rough objects have high friction and then smooth objects should have sort of lower friction, but then it's weird because if you actually smooth the objects too much, they get sticky again. And this leads to a process called vacuum welding, where you go into a vacuum, you clean off a couple pieces of metal so that there's no oxides on the surface of them and stick them together. And if you take two perfect surfaces and stick them together, how do the atoms know which object they belong to? And it just becomes a single object. So this is a really weird small surface physics uh, uh, is a bizarre corner of physics, but it's amazing. And so it uh, gives rise to the study of friction. We're not going to deal with super complicated models of friction. We are going to deal with a far simpler thing. And we're going to assert what we call a model. And so models are a mathematical representation of how we're going to describe friction. And it is something that is good enough to give us some interesting physics. And if it cannot explain the uh, model or the behavior that we see, it's a bad model. And we're going to have to go ahead and revise it and develop a new idea. The model we use for uh, friction is to say that the friction force is equal to some coefficient, which is just a number, times the normal force. So that's basically how hard the object is pushing into the surface describes uh, how hard that surface is pushing back on the object, and therefore it gives some scaling for how uh, much friction force there is. We're going to start out by describing kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is what happens when one surface is moving with respect to another. And this leads to a friction force that has a vector form of the coefficient times the normal force times the tangent vector with a negative sign. This is implying that forces uh, from friction are always opposed to the direction that the object is moving. So this is uh, a negative uh, opposite direction of motion. The other 
friction force that we will deal with is a static friction force. And this represents the friction force that happens when uh, two objects are at rest or two surfaces are at rest with uh, respect to each other. And we have this sort of sticky model uh, for friction, which is that static friction provides exactly enough force to keep an object motionless with respect to another object until you reach a certain threshold at which point the friction can no longer maintain it in that equilibrium uh, position and then it will kind of break free and start sliding at which point kinetic friction will take over. So uh, let's kind of view uh, what these physics models look like by examining one of these physics education tutorials. Okay, Ooh, this is a spring. Here's uh, some friction force. And so I have a little uh, object, a uh, person who is pushing on an object that is at rest. Uh, we have a nice um, st stiff block here, and we're illustrating the forces here, and we'll give it lots of friction. And so when that person pushes on this object here, the static friction force is going to keep it in place. So notice the friction force is always balancing the applied force, and that'll be true up to a certain level, at which point it breaks free and the person starts to accelerate the object. And the harder you push, the more acceleration there will be. And then you can let go. And then the kinetic friction force is opposing uh, the motion and causes the object to slow back down again. So you'll notice what happens uh, here. I'm going to put on the values so we can sort of see this in detail. You see the forces grow and grow and grow. And when the object breaks free, I want you to pay attention to the magnitude of the friction force as it gets larger, and then suddenly it drops back down. So typically, the coefficient of kinetic friction, or how much friction an object experiences when moving, is actually going to be smaller than the maximum force that's available under the static friction. So what we can do is we can put uh, some more objects on here to increase uh, the force required, even to a point where the person cannot move it because uh, the friction force is so high. Uh, we can turn down the amount of friction, and then they will. Uh, that's the coefficient of friction, and then we will get the same behavior as last time. As the person pushes harder, uh, the object starts to move, and then the friction force will oppose the motion. So we have a very basic model for what the friction force is doing. So returning here uh, to the mathematics of this, uh, we have these coefficients here, and uh, we saw this behavior where that coefficient of static friction was defining the maximum force that an object would experience, would just be mu s n. It's an important point, I'm going to yell at, about this and get all enthusiastic, which is that the static friction force does not always equal mu s times n. It is whatever is required to keep it in equilibrium up to that limit. So there's that less than or equal sign right there to give us that point. Okay, final thing is whether objects are undergoing static or connective friction kinetic friction. So if you have two surfaces that are moving with respect to each other, that's kinetic friction. If they are not slipping or sliding with respect to each other, that's static friction. And the big point here is something like a car's tires. The tires are not slipping, under good circumstances, with respect to the road. And that means that the, the car's tires are applying static friction and not kinetic friction under this uh, basic model. So here's some examples of coefficients of friction. You'll notice that on average, the uh, coefficient of static friction is larger than kinetic friction. That's that sort of force gets larger and then kind of breaks free component of the model. Uh, smooth surfaces like Teflon have very low coefficients and then very sticky surfaces like rubber on concrete, the kind of thing you want your tires to have a very high coefficients of friction. Okay, uh, so we can do a little bit of uh, an example here. So let's consider uh, this case here. 
which is a wooden block that is traveling on a frictionless surface uh, at V-naught until it encounters a wooden ramp inclined at an angle theta to the horizontal. And we want to know how far up the ramp will it travel, and we'll use uh, a kinetic friction model because the wood block is moving with respect to a wooden ramp. Okay. So let's switch over here to do a little whiteboarding. And whenever we get this, we want to consider the case of a uh, block here on the ramp. And so we're going to start out by solving dynamics uh, case by establishing uh, a, well, first we draw a free body diagram. So when the, uh, up, when the block is on the ramp, it's going to have some forces on it, like its weight, which is mg. It's going to have a normal force that will keep it move, uh, from falling through the ramp. And so that's going to have magnitude normal force. And then it's going to have a kinetic friction force on it that's slowing it down. And that's going to act down the ramp because the velocity vector is pointed up the ramp. So we have this as our free body diagram. I'm going to set up a normal tangential coordinate system, nt. And that means that as I look at uh, this um, free body diagram here, I'm going to grab and move my mg over here because I need to construct uh, the, uh, well, I need to break down the mg vector into my nt coordinate system. So in this uh, sort of reference, nt, t is in the opposite direction of kinetic friction force. The normal force is in the direction of the normal component uh, of the acceleration. And then we are going to break down mg into this coordinate frame. And we've chosen this coordinate system because more of the forces, the normal force and the kinetic friction force, are aligned with it and uh, only mg is not already in that coordinate system. So that makes it like a good choice because we have to do the smallest number of trig decompositions. So then uh, I'm going to go ahead and break down mg. Uh, this, this angle here is theta. And so this is mg cos theta uh, in that direction. And then this uh, vector component down here is going to be mg sine theta. And so the sum of the forces in the normal direction is just going to be the normal force is pointed up, mg cos theta is pointed down, and the surface constrains the object to not move with respect to the normal direction. It doesn't fall through the ramp or go sailing off of it. And so I'm going to set that that's m a normal, and that's going to be zero because the normal acceleration is zero. It stays on the surface. The sum of the forces in the tangent direction is just going to be mg pointing down the ramp and fk pointing down the ramp. And so that's minus mu k times the normal force minus mg sine theta. And that's going to be equal to m times the tangential acceleration. And here we have the basic algebra of a force problem, which is we have two equations and we don't know the normal force and we don't know the acceleration. And we want to find the acceleration by eliminating the normal force. So I'll use the top equation uh, to solve and find out that n is equal to mg cos theta, which I will then substitute down here into the second equation. And then I'm going to get that minus mu k times mg cos theta minus mg sine theta is equal to mat. So carrying on with our solution here, uh, the first thing I notice is that there's an m in every term. There's one there, one there, and one there. So I am going to aggressively cancel that out. Cancel, cancel, cancel. And then I have a solution for my tangential acceleration, which I will just rewrite here. And I'll just say that A sub T is equal to pull out a G, and that's mu K uh, cos theta plus sine theta. And there's a negative sign in front. So it's 
uh, has that magnitude with this combination of trig terms. And now I want to answer the question, how far up the ramp will it travel? Great news, everybody. This is a constant acceleration, which means that we are able to fall back on our kinematic equation. And the ones that I want to solve or uh, use is that uh, the final velocity squared minus the initial velocity squared is equal to two times the acceleration times the distance up uh, from where it started. So it's going to be xi and xf. So this difference here is what we want. This is what we want. That's how far up the ramp it travels from its initial to its final position. Its final speed is going to go to zero because it's at rest. And therefore, I can solve that uh, in this case, x final minus x initial, what we care about, is equal to negative vi squared, uh, which is given as v naught in the problem, great, uh, times 2 times the acceleration, which is negative g times this mess of trig, mu k cos theta plus sine theta. And then we pull that all out, close the brackets, cancel the negative signs, and we get that it's uh, whatever the initial, um, I'll sub in v naught for the initial speed. Uh, so 2g times mu k cos theta plus sine theta. All right. Fantastic. We have figured out how far up the ramp it goes. Okay. Uh, so the next thing that we can consider is a different kind of friction. Uh, this case, it is fluid friction. Now, fluids are an amazing study. It's one of my favorite corners of physics. And we have to worry about fluid resistance. The obvious kind of resistance that we worry about is air resistance. But I'm going to start out with a slightly simpler model. Uh, and uh, for certain types of fluid where we have relatively low speeds or very viscous thick liquids, so these are things like oils or corn syrup or something like that, high viscosity fluids, we can have a force model, remember, like friction, it's a mathematical model that's good enough, which says that the drag force uh, on an object is just equal to some coefficient k times the velocity vector with a negative sign. So previously we asserted it was a coefficient times the uh, normal force. Uh, this coefficient carries units because uh, a velocity times something has to give us a force and it depends on the shape of the object and the properties of the fluid. And uh, this particular model for the aficionados in the audience is the um, called the Stokes drag after the uh, scientist uh, Stokes. And so this is just sort of showing that as if a fluid is moving past a spherical object, it experiences this kind of drag force, uh, which they call big F here, and I've called little f over there. Now, uh, it's kind of an interesting model uh, because we also have a case where we have high uh, speeds and low viscosity uh, fluids. And when that happens, we get a property of fluids called turbulence, which starts setting in. And oops, uh, let's see some turbulence. Uh, and so this shows uh, the kinds of behaviors that you see in a fluid pattern uh, as an object on the border of starting to have turbulent fluid flow. You get these really interesting vortices and whirls. And then as turbulence sets in, it becomes completely chaotic and a mess. And so this happens for objects that are moving quickly or in fluids that have low uh, viscosity, kind of like um, air. Uh, it tends to be low viscosity fluid, and so we see a lot of turbulence as objects move through air. In that case, we use a force model that says that the drag force is some coefficient, again, times v squared, again, operating in the opposite direction of motion. So this one depends on the velocity squared, and then the Stokes drag only depends on the velocity. Uh, or sorry, this is the speed squared because it has no direction. I've included the direction with the tangent vector, unit vector, and a negative sign. 
Uh, the drag coefficient d is what tells us uh, the co uh, it is uh, set by the fluid and the largely by the shape of the object. And it's kind of cool because with these systems, you can actually set up a force balance. And you can basically say, at what point does something like an object falling through this fluid achieve a force equilibrium so there are no longer any accelerations. And we call this a terminal velocity. So if we drop an object into a thick, heavy fluid and it experiences Stokes drag, it will speed up because the weight is pulling it down, showing that here, until it reaches some maximum speed where the drag force balances the weight. And you can just say that the drag force equal, uh, balances mg, so set up this particular uh, force diagram, and solve for what that is, and we get what is called the terminal velocity, which depends on the weight of the object, and then this k, which is fluid properties and object properties. So k is something that I have to specify in the problem if I want you to uh, solve it. Okay. Uh, similarly, if we do the same thing for the uh, turbulent drag model, uh, where it goes like velocity squared, you can set that up and find out that it takes the square root of mg over d for uh, that drag model. Okay, so I want to do a kind of quick example. Well, it's not a quick example. It's an illustrative example, because this is kind of an important case of what happens to an object in the case of a fluid resistance. We're going to work with the Stokes drag model and we're going to imagine dropping a metal ball into a tall container of oil and ask what is the position of the ball as a function of time if we assume that we have this uh, drag force, uh, F drag is minus K, and this should be a V vector, uh, not a V unit vector. Assume it starts with Nagel's rule and initial velocity at the top of the oil. So if we start out with this setup and we uh, correct this to be a proper velocity vector, I want to set up uh, the problem uh, as follows, which is I have an object that is um, moving and I'm going to choose it, a weird coordinate system. I'm going to assume that the y direction is moving downward. Uh, I have that choice. It's just a little bit easier because then we can sort of figure out things moving to larger velocities correspond to uh, positive numbers uh, in this case. So if we think about mg is the weight pulling down, and then we have an unbalanced drag force, which is pointing up. And this means that we have an equation, k, uh, sorry, we have in this coordinate system, mg pulls it downward, and minus k times v uh, pulls it upward. So it's negative because it's pointing upward, but the uh, positive direction is downward, therefore it gets a negative sign. And that's equal to the mass times the acceleration. Well, that's exciting. And this is our first case that we run into where the accelerations are not constant. And that means we have to be careful. Uh, and by careful, I mean calculus. So I'm gonna do a couple things. The first thing I want to do is I want to divide the whole problem through by the constant k. I'm going to divide that by k, that by k, and that by k. And the reason is, is that this mg over k is something I have seen before. I call that the terminal velocity. Then I cancel out these k's, and then I have an mk over there. So I get an equation that looks like this. I get that this whole thing becomes vt minus v, terminal velocity minus v is equal to m over k times the acceleration. But an acceleration is a time derivative of the velocity. So now we have an expression that looks a lot like uh, some calculus. And now I'm going to engage in what the mathematicians like to call a gross abuse of differential forms, which is I'm going to multiply both sides by a tiny time interval and divide both sides by v over vt. So I'm essentially solving for v, uh, I'm putting all of the v's on one side by itself and all of the t's on the other side by themselves. 
And so if I do that multiplication, I'm going to get that this is k over m times dt, and there's a reason why I'm going to kind of bookkeep the constant there, equals dv over vt minus v. So if you look at this, you're like, oh, okay, this uh, looks uh, pecu you know, peculiar. I can sort of understand what's happening here uh, is that this term went, oops, this term went into the denominator down here under this dv, and this k over m, uh, m over k became a k over m over there, and then this dt went up. And we can do this. It's not technically correct, but it is correct enough for physics, if not for math. So, sorry math folks, uh, I did a bad thing. All right, uh, the next thing that I want to do is to solve this equation, and I'm going to solve this by integrating. Uh, and this is a neat thing where I can say, well, in a tiny, like physically, what this means is that in a tiny interval of time, times some number, the velocity changes by an amount that's 1 over vt minus v. It's basically the velocity increases by an amount, and but that amount depends on how close it is to the terminal velocity. If v is small, it increases by, uh, uh, it's going to increase uh, by 1 over vt, and that number is going to get uh, smaller uh, as v is going to get closer to uh, the v. So it's going to become 1 over a small number, which would get larger and uh, larger. OK, so at this point, we can do a little bit of uh, calculus. And that calculus is we're just going to integrate both sides of the equation uh, from the start of the problem to the end of the problem. So what that means is I can integrate the uh, left-hand side from 0 to t. There's some constant in front, k over m uh, dt. And that's an easy integral, so we're happy with that. And then for the final one, uh, at from 0 to t, we're going to say that the velocity goes from 0 to some unknown speed v. And then we're going to integrate dv over vt minus v. Uh, so the left-hand integral, it's a straightforward one uh, because the k of ram are, non -con are, are constant. So it's the integral of dt uh, from t to t0. So this is k or uh, m, so from 0 to t, uh, times t minus 0. That's the final minus the initial uh, here. And that just goes to km over t. The right-hand side's a little trickier. Um, and earlier, uh, I asserted that the integral of 1 over x was the natural log of x. And so that's a similar case that we have here, is we have a natural log, but then we have this constant that's added onto it. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, consider, I'm going to first off, I'm going to change the order of the denominator by introducing a negative sign. So I'm going to say this is negative, negative integral 0 to v of dv over v minus vt. So that's just algebra. I can always multiply through by a negative 1, uh, or pull out a negative 1. And then this second term I'm going to assert is the in, is uh, that little coefficient doesn't uh, matter for the integration. And I'm going to say that this is equal to, uh, this whole thing will go to an integral that is the natural log of v minus vt. And I'm just kind of writing it there in red uh, as an indicator because I have to remember my bounds of integration as well. Uh, so the po important point is that I'm going to take the derivative of that and I get whatever's inside, 1 over whatever's inside, so that's 1 over v minus vt times the derivative of that, and then that uh, is uh, with the vt is just constant, drops out, so it just leaves me with uh, 1. And so therefore the derivative of this expression will get me back to here as hoped for. Okay. So that means that I can take uh, the negative sign, and then uh, this is equal to the natural log of v minus vt evaluated at 0 to whatever the final velocity is. 
And so from there, I'm going to come back and I'll write the left-hand side again. again. So that's kt over m. And then the right-hand side, I would have to integrate, uh, evaluate at the start, which is negative natural log of v minus vt uh, minus uh, the integral or minus the answer evaluated at zero. And if I plug zero in here, I just get that this is minus the natural log of negative vt. Uh, okay. And I'm going to pull that minus sign over to the other side. I really want to get it away from my natural log. So this is negative kt over m. And then I'm going to use my rules of logarithms. And I know that the difference of logs is equal to the log of the quotient of those. So this is the natural log of v minus vt over negative vt. And so then I'm going to uh, divide these both these parts by uh, vt, and then I'm going to end up with the natural log of 1 minus v over vt. And then I can exponentiate both sides. So I get that 1 minus v over vt is equal to e to the negative kt over m. And I'll go ahead and I will solve uh, this expression that I will get 1 minus e to the negative kt over m is equal to v over vt. And then that's just going to go that v as a function of time, so I'm introducing now function notation, is v of t times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m. And if I look at that function, it has a graph that looks a little something like this. It starts out, so it's time versus velocity. If I have up here at the top, I have my terminal velocity. This is a graph that starts out at zero and rises up, but asymptotes to the terminal velocity. So it gets closer and closer to the terminal velocity, but this exponential means that we never arrive there. It actually just reaches a limit where it can no longer, uh, you know, or it, it just limits to that in infinite time. So it gets closer and closer, but never actually arrives at the terminal velocity. It's really cool. Oh, uh, darn it. We want the position. Well, uh, this is, uh, as we say in the business, calculus. So I'm going to grab my formula for the velocity. I'm going to copy it. We're going to head to page two. Welcome to our own exciting world of page two. Okay, so... I've got this wonderful little expression here and a little bit more besides, it looks like. Yeah, goodbye for that piece. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to understand how to turn this into a position. Well, I'm going to use the same approach, which is, oops, in a different color, uh, that the velocity here is just the position derivative as a function of time. And that is a co constant, vt. Uh, times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m. And then I can uh, isolate for my variables. So dx is equal to vt times 1 minus e to the negative kt over m, all times dt. And I have everything with a position variable over here, and I have everything with a... Um, a uh, everything with a time variable over here. And I'm actually, let me back up here before this gets too awful. I'm going to call this the y direction, not the x direction. I apologize for getting very enthusiastic about x's. I, I have plenty of x's. Uh, so, but we're going to do y's here because y. Uh, and then we're going to integrate uh, this expression from the start to the finish. And so we go from zero to wherever we are actually considering the position uh, is from zero to whatever the time is. So the left-hand side of this equation is pretty straightforward. That is just y minus zero, also known as y. Uh, and then the x component is just the integral of this expression uh, 
and I can pull out my VT and then I'll integrate 1 minus e to the minus kt over m all times dt. And uh, the way integrals work is that you can integrate the sum of the integrals is the integral of the sums. And so I get vt, and then I get two integrals. Integral of 1 dt, also known as dt from 0 to t, minus the integral from 0 to t of e to the negative kt over m dt. And so then that's vt times. Uh, this first term is just the time. And then the second term, uh, well, it's the integral of an exponent. Now, important rule in calculus that integral e to the x dx is just equal to e to the x. The integral of e to the x is itself. This isn't e to the x, though. It's e to the negative kt over m with a dt. So what I'm going to do is what's called a variable substitution, which I'm going to say that u is a new variable, is negative kt over m. Well, that's exciting. Uh, and so then I can rewrite this integral as integral 0 to, well, t, whatever that is, uh, of e to the u. That's great. But then I actually have to worry about the dt's. So I have to calculate what du by dt is. And that's minus k over m. And then I'll say that du is equal to negative k over m dt, engaging in my gross abuse of differential forms. And when I do that, I need to make sure that I have a du uh, over here. And so that's just needs, that says I can get my dt, that's the hard part, and then I need to multiply that by negative uh, k over m. But what we're going to do is we're going to say that this is, uh, I'm going to multiply by negative m over k times negative k over m times dt. And then this expression, the this part here, becomes the du, leaving a coefficient to come out front. Let me close my square bracket because otherwise we're being uncivilized. And then uh, we pop on down here and we do a little more calculus. So this is vt times t minus, and then this uh, m over k term comes out from, so negative m over k. And then we do the integral from 0 to t of e to the u du, which I asserted previously was v of t times t minus minus, ooh, that's exciting, plus m of k times e to the u du uh, is just e to the u du. So this is e to the u evaluated from 0 to t. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, it means I have to return to my variable substitution and stick things back in here. So this is t plus m over k times the uh, e to the u is e to the negative kt over m evaluated at t. So that's e to the minus kt over m. Okay, that's cool. Minus this thing at 0 and e to the 0 is 1. So it's that over 1. Uh, and so this gives me an expression for what's actually happening and sort of says that this object is going to start out falling very slowly but then it's going to eventually come up and hit a sort of straight line where the slope of this straight line, sorry, this is t and y, uh, and then the slope of this line, so dy by dt, is going to be approximately equal to the terminal velocity. So it accelerates up and then hits the constant speed and then just keeps moving. Okay, as promised, wasn't easy but it's illustrative of many of the techniques we need. And so we're starting out with this, and as you become more and more comfortable with integrals through your math class, we're going to find that we can do more and more physics problems because they all fall around this basic idea that we're going to write down F equals MA, and then right here is all the physics. We can then say that a is the time derivative of the velocity, and we can actually figure out where the object will be, not just how fast it's accelerating. So it's really actually kind of an exciting set of mechanics that we have in front of us. Okay.
with that behind us, let's talk about springs. So, uh, springs are not mentioned in your book yet, but I kind of want to call them out uh, here because we have a, um, uh, we, we basically have a very similar uh, approach to what we have with friction. Uh, so we model our spring forces with something that's called Hooke's Law. It's a terrible name. It's not really a physical law. It is a mathematical model for how a spring would work. And uh, I apologize, but common notation is to once again call this a K. So there's a coefficient in front of it, and that's called the force constant of the spring. And it has units of force per unit distance, where the distance is the length of the spring minus the equilibrium length of the spring. And so if I stretch it, there's a negative sign out here, and it pulls it back towards equilibrium. And if I squeeze the spring, uh, that means that x is going to be less than x naught. This number is negative, and so then it's going to push it back towards equilibrium. So that always means that a spring is trying to get back to its equilibrium length. So I do have a, a force model here uh, that kind of illustrates it using this little uh, cartoon uh, available from the physics education tutorials. And here it is. Uh, so we have uh, this spring here and there are uh, no forces on our spring initially. And then I can sort of push and grab it and push it and pull it and uh, be attached to it. And at equilibrium length, right about there, there is no uh, force acting on it. So I can have my applied force and my spring force, and you can't see any of them. And But then if I stretch it, you'll notice what's happening is if I'm pulling back, that's the red force, a spring force acts in the opposite direction of equilibrium. And then you can go the other way and scrunch that spring and push on it, and then it tries to restore to equilibrium. I can illustrate the equilibrium position and the displacement here from there, and you can see that the spring force is always acting in the opposite direction of its displacement. So we sort of see how that goes. And then uh, we also have the constant, spring constant K. We can really crank it up and get a big beefy spring and then pull on that, and you'll notice that for a tiny little displacement, we get these huge forces uh, as a result of that. So if I crank this up to a thousand, that means every 10 centimeters I go, I get 100 newtons of force, and if I push the other way, I get 100 units, uh, or 100 newtons gives me 10 centimeters of displacement. If I turn so we have a maximum force of 100 newtons here. If I turn that down to uh, 100 newtons per meter, I can go a full meter uh, because the spring is uh, quite uh, sort of squishy. And so I can change my forces quite easily. And so that constant K indicates how stiff the spring is. Okay, just want to do a quick example illustrating this which says a spring has an equilibrium length of 0.1 meters and a spring constant of K equals 200 newtons per meter. If the spring is hung from a ceiling and a one kilogram mass is suspended from it, how long will it be? So we kind of have a cartoon here where we have a spring suspended from the ceiling and I attach a mass to it. And then that mass stretches the spring downward. So it gets a little bit longer. And it comes to an equilibrium. So initial, and we want to figure out how long this uh, uh, spring is, x, assuming that if there's no weight on it, it has a much shorter uh, spring. M. So, oh, sorry, without m. Yeah. Then in uh, equilibrium, it would have a shorter length that's x naught. So we write down our forces uh, using a free body diagram. We have a spring force that's pushing up. We have a weight that's pulling down. And so then we just say that the force on the in the spring minus mg leads it to equilibrium, so that's zero accelerations, and then I use my expression for the spring force, 
And the spring force is saying that if the spring is uh, at, at equilibrium, then it's going to uh, basically be pointed upward. And so the longer I displace my spring, so k times x minus x naught, minus mg is equal to zero. So as x gets longer, there's going to be a larger spring force uh, pushing up on it. And so then I can solve for my um, uh, x uh, knowing everything else in the equation. So we get that k times x minus x naught is equal to mg. Divide by k, we get x minus x naught is mg over k. And then we get that x is equal to x naught plus mg over k. Then we plug in some numbers. So x is equal to x naught at 0.1 meters, uh, given in the problem right about mm, here. Then we have our uh, mass, which is a solid one kilogram. We have g, which is 10 meters per second squared, because we're on a slightly bigger, better Earth, all over 200 newtons per meter, and is my spring constant. And so then I multiply this out, I get 10 over 200, that's 0 0.05. So that goes to 0 0.05 meters. And when I add those two pieces together, that's 0 0.15 meters and is the answer. A lot better than the fluid drag problem, uh, or at least faster fluid drag problems. Amazing. Yeah, you, you, we'd be lucky to be solving physics like that all the time. Okay, the final thing I want to talk about is non-uniform circular motion. Uh, and then I'll do some examples. So uh, the non-uniform circular motion is the, something that we sort of erased in the idea of accelerations and vectors, but now we have the mechanics to think about it in the context of forces. Oops, I would like to be over here. Um, and so uh, what we have in the case of non-circular motion, we know I, I want to consider an object on a circular path, but not at a constant speed. Uh, since it's on a circular path, we know that the acceleration in the tangent direction must have a magnitude of v squared over r. And if I'm going to stay on that, the forces in the system must change to make this true. So I want to consider a roller coaster. So this is illustrating the best part of an amusement park, which is the loop-the-loop -loop on the roller coaster, which is allows this roller coaster to not be strongly attached to the track, but it's going to basically shoot up over the loop-to-loop -loop and go down based solely on the forces and the requirement to stay on that circular track. This is the case of non-circular motion. So if we think about that roller coaster on the surface of the track, I have a couple of forces acting on it. I have a normal force as the track pushes on the roller coaster and keeps it going uh, in the direction, accelerating it towards the center circle. I also have a weight. And so this gives me the two forces that are creating tangential and normal accelerations. I know that the normal acceleration is going to produce the centripetal acceleration and will always lead to a centripetal acceleration of v squared over r. Uh, but my t, a t, can be anything I want. So it has a tangential acceleration, uh, a t. And in this case, mg would be providing a component of that tangential acceleration and sort of speeding the object up as it moves down here. I want to consider the loop-the-loop in the context of what's happening here at the top. So this is the critical point. At this case, there is a normal force uh, from the loop pushing downward, creating an acceleration along with the weight. And so what I'd like to know is what is the normal force on the roller coaster if it's going around and it has these properties and we have G is 10 meters per second squared. And so if I consider that in a uh, sort of F equals MA case, I know that there are these two forces. I have a normal force and MG, and I know pointing in this direction, there's a tangential acceleration, and it must have a magnitude of V squared over, well, I call it a lowercase r, r in this problem. 
So uh, if I have these two cases, then I know that the normal force plus mg, I'm going to pick this in the sum of the forces in the tangential direction. Uh, sorry, these are normal accelerations. I've done it again. This is a normal acceleration. And I know the forces in the normal direction are n plus mg, and that must equal to the mass times the acceleration, m times v squared over r. So we know it must have that acceleration if it's on a circular track. And then in this case, I can just say that the normal force is then just m uh, v squared over r minus mg. That's it. I can just solve those two forces, provide the centripetal acceleration. We know one of them's the weight. Solve for the other one. So, so let's just plug in some numbers. The normal force is then equal to the mass of the roller coaster, which is 200 kilograms, uh, times v squared, which is 10 meters per second, quantity squared, all over the radius, which is 5 meters, minus mg, which is 200 kilograms, times 10 meters per second squared. Um, this latter part goes to 2,000 newtons. This former part is 200 times 10 squared, so that's 20,000 over 5. That part goes to 4,000 newtons. And so the difference of forces is our answer. That's 2,000 newtons. 4,000 minus 2,000 is 2,000. Solved. What if the radius was 20 meters instead of 5? In that case, the normal force would just be mv squared over r minus mg, just like in the previous. And so that's 200 kilograms times v squared, 10 meters per second squared, all over, here's where we stick in our 20 meters, minus the 2,000 newtons from mg. Well, that's 20,000 over 20. And so this expression here goes to... 1,000 newtons. And so the normal force is negative 1,000 newtons. And that's a problem because the normal forces only provide forces normal to the direction of the acceleration. The normal forces only act in the uh, direction pointing downward. This is saying that the normal force must be pointing upward in order for this uh, acceleration to stay on the track. And that means that either the track is sticky or the roller coaster has fallen off the track and destroyed uh, the people on board, which is a sad day, but an important lesson for physicists. So that leaves, brings us to our uh, basic conclusion that the normal force is whatever is required to provide that centripetal acceleration. And if it can't provide it, then roller coaster falls off track. Okay. I've kind of reached the end of the main points that I wanted to cover, but I wanted to go over a few examples in uh, the time that remains me. I got three sort of sentinel examples, but the core content of this is done. Um, the first example that I want to cover is the egg ninja. So if we imagine that the egg ninja is right here and is suspended by a massless cable that goes up through a hole in a table and is attached to a little block of jello that's sliding around on this frictionless table, uh, like that. I'm going to ask, how fast does that jello have to be moving so that the egg ninja is not falling? Well, uh, important physics questions, right? Uh, so the first thing is that I want to consider the free body diagrams of the objects. So uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to consider a top-down view of the jello. I might say, well, what are the forces on the jello? Top down jello. There is a tension in the string, and it's pulling it towards the center of the circle. T. And we're done. There's a normal force pushing up from the table. Uh, there's an MG pulling down, keeps it in the table. I'm not going to worry about it. But the top down, there's one force. That's T. And I know that T must be providing the centripetal acceleration towards the center of the circle, v squared over r times the mass of the jello. Cool. The free body diagram for the ninja egg has a tension force pulling up, 
has an mg uh, or me times g pulling down. So I have that's in equilibrium. So the sum of the forces there is zero because it's in equilibrium. And that's T minus mg. So that tells us that the tension force is equal to m e g. And so then I can take this expression, substitute it up here for the tension, and solve for v. And I will about just pop over to this corner of the blank page and do that. So it says that m e g is equal to m j times v squared over r. I solve for v squared, and that is rg times the mass of the egg over the mass of the jello. And then I take the square root and I get my answer. So that's root rg times mass egg over mass jello. And that's what keeps the egg ninja from falling down. Okay. The important point here is that you just have one force acting on the jello. That's the tension for in the horizontal direction. That's the tension force. It just keeps it uh, pulling in towards the center. It provides the centripetal acceleration. Problem solved. It's just required to do that to keep everything in equilibrium. Okay. Uh, the next one I want to solve is less uh, trivial. And it says a car is traveling around a banked curve. There's a static friction, mu s, between the car and the surface. So remember, the tires are keeping the uh, car in place, and they are not slipping against the ramp. Actually, we're going to continue the, uh, consider the case where they are getting close uh, to slip, because we want to solve for the case where the minimum speed that the car can travel around the circle without slipping. Okay. I'm actually going to take this over to regular uh, grid paper because we're going to need some space. So we have our uh, ramp and we have a car on it, which, uh, as with all physics, is just a point mass. Now I'm going to consider the forces on that object. And I should note that this angle here is theta, and there are some forces on it. There is a static friction, there's a normal force, which is normal to the ramp. There's an mg, which is pointing down. And finally, there is a static friction force. And I don't know whether it points up the ramp or down the ramp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it pointing up the ramp for now. And if we get to an answer that's negative, it tells us that our answer was wrong. Uh, or direction was wrong, and it must be pointing the other direction, much like we saw with the normal force in the roller coaster, where the negative force means that we just picked the wrong direction in our free body diagram. And so it's pointed in the opposite direction compared to what we took. So normally, under most circumstances, I would come up with a normal tangential coordinate system uh, that's oriented in the ramp, and I would solve the problem there. We're not going to do that in this case. And there's an important reason why, is that normally you pick the thing that has the coordinate system where the forces kind of do the least projections uh, and you do the least amount of trig. But there's an overarching principle, which is if you're going to pick a coordinate system, it's generally best that your accelerations are oriented with the coordinate system because you can decompose forces plenty. And so that's what I need to do. I need to pick a coordinate system where the accelerations are uh, in the, um, uh, or are oriented in that direction. And you might think, well, it's going around a ramp in a circle. So it's sort of coming out of the page, uh, hurtling towards us. And it's on this kind of circular ramp that's kind of banked uh, to the side. In that case, isn't the acceleration just down the ramp uh, because it's pointing towards the center of the circle? The answer is no. The acceleration always points to the center of the circle that the object is traversing. And so if we think about it sort of going around a circle, it's at a horizontal plane uh, in this kind of three-dimensional object. And so the centripetal acceleration is pointing horizontally. So it's centripetal acceleration is pointing uh, straight towards the center in the sort of xy direction, not in the nt direction. So I'm going to do all my physics in the x 
y coordinate system because the centripetal acceleration is only in the x direction. And if I do that, then I can start doing some decompositions. All right. So first off, it's not moving vertically. It's not moving up or down vertically. So I know that the sum of the forces in the y direction are going to have an acceleration of zero, and that the sum of the forces in the x direction, I'm going to pick x sort of pointing horizontally here, is going to be the mass of the car times how fast it's going over the radius of the circle, uh, where r is how far I am from the center of the circle. Okay, uh, given that, um, call that v squared over big R, then I do just some force decomposition. Well, um, if I look at my uh, problem here, I can see that this angle, well, we're not doing that decomposition. We almost always do that decomposition, but we're going to do this decomposition instead and get these forces into the xy uh, plane. And so if I do that, this angle is theta, and this angle is theta. Therefore, for the forces in the y direction, I have two for components pointing up. I have that that's n times the cosine of theta points up, uh, plus the static friction force sine theta also points up, minus mg points down. And then I can actually, I want to consider the limiting case and so I'm going to set my static friction force to be mu s n, which is the max friction case. Normally I don't get to do this, but I want the minimum speed. And so this requires the most amount of friction. And so that's what's going to allow me to get away from that. So I'll be able to substitute that in here in a moment. Now, the next thing I want to do is consider the sum of the forces in the horizontal direction. The normal force has a x component pointing in that direction. The friction force is pointed in the opposite direction as we've set. So we know that those two forces will carry the opposite sign. So we have the normal force sine theta minus the friction force cos theta is going to have an acceleration mv squared over r towards the center of the circle. And now we're basically done. We don't know what the normal force is, and we want to solve for v, but we have two equations uh, with which we can do that. So I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of algebra, which I'm sure is a thrill to everybody. So uh, I'm going to first solve this equation on top up here for uh, the normal force uh, by recognizing that the normal force cos theta plus fs, oh sorry, uh, I'm trying to actually do the substitution, mu s times normal force times sine theta. I'm going to push the mg over to the other side where the zero is, so it just becomes mg. I'm going to factor out an n and divide through by the rest of the mass. So that's equal to mg over cos theta plus mu s sine theta. And then I have a normal force that I can stick into the x direction equation, recognizing that there's also a normal force there. So I'm going to say that the normal force times sine theta minus mu s n cos theta is equal to mv squared over r. And then I will uh, pull out a normal force, the normal force times sine theta minus mu s cos theta is equal to mv squared over r. And now my substitution comes in, that normal force goes in there. And so then I get that this is mg uh, sine theta minus mu s cos theta. That's the remnants at the top. Then I'll put the denominator that I solve for from the normal force underneath. So that's cos theta plus mu s sine theta. And that whole mass is equal to mv squared over r. Woo! Life's good. My masses cancel out. And then I can solve, put my r up there and take the square root. So I end up with I'm going to just exchange sides here because I'm getting close to a solution. Uh, that's Rg times sine theta minus mu s cos theta. I really should use my copy paste function more. Uh, cos theta plus mu s sine theta. 
and take the square root and we're done. So square root of RG times sine theta minus mu s cos theta over cos theta plus mu s sine theta. Finished. We got ourselves an answer. And the friction force didn't turn out negative. Uh, because uh, as long as that sort of angle is set up here. So uh, we looked like we picked the right direction uh, when we got going. So everything is grand. For my final act, I want to solve this problem, which shows a bead having a mass of 0.75 kilograms and negligible size slides over the surface of a circular rod for which the coefficient of kinetic friction is mu k is 0 0.3. The radius of the collar is 0.1 meters. And basically, so this is a little ring with a bead on it, and that bead is sliding around like this, but there's friction, so it slowly comes to a stop. And the answer is, if I give it a flick, how far around the rod does it go as it travels? So this is going to require just some techniques. And I want to set up the physics, and then I'll just sort of say, okay, the physics is done. And then it's all math all the time, uh, which, I mean, is a thrill for a lot of people. Uh, so uh, let's uh, get going on this. So I kind of have to consider this in three dimensions. And so I kind of have two free body diagrams. I'm going to kind of consider them uh, from here. So if I look down on the top of the bead, I have the bead, and it's going around a circle like this. I'm going to sort of consider it here in uh, this kind of xy plane. So if I consider x and y like this, then it has a force towards the center of the circle that's provided by the normal force. I'm going to call this the horizontal component of that. And then if it's traveling, it has a kinetic friction force it's pulling backwards, so that's going to have uh, a variable fk. And those are the only forces on it. Um, the, from the side view, this is kind of looking at this in the yz direction. There's this bead. It has a friction force. This is the same force as is over here. Same forces, same forces. But in this direction, in the z direction, there is a normal force that I'm called the vertical component of the force that opposes the weight, mg. And that keeps it on the rod. So this means that there is a normal force uh, from the vertical and the horizontal component and that the total component of the vector force, n, is equal to n horiz plus n vert squared. So that's from the Pythagorean theorem. And this is the important thing. That is the normal force that goes into the kinetic friction model. Not the horizontal force only, and not the vertical force only, but the total normal force is what's determining the coefficient. So it's sliding around and the normal force keeps it on this track and also it supports it from falling off of the bead. So it's those two components that gives me my total normal force uh, here. And so then my uh, kinetic friction uh, force is just gonna be mu k times n. Now we know a little bit more about the forces. We know that the horizontal component of the normal force, this one up here, is the only one oriented towards the center of the circle. It's operating in the direction of that sort of black line shown there. And so therefore, the normal component of the horizontal force must provide the centripetal acceleration at any given time. Here's the weird thing. That friction, that coefficient depends on the speed. The speed contributes to the normal horizontal force. Oops, up here. That creates a friction force which reduces the speed. So we are not going to be in a constant acceleration system, and so we've got to be extra careful. Uh, so 
uh, we know that the normal component is doing that. We also know a bit about the vertical component. We know that the vertical component of the force, n vert, minus mg is just going to be equal to zero. So the vertical component is equal to mg. So that's really pretty cool because we have an expression for the horizontal and the vertical components of the forces, and then we can relate that to the kinetic friction force. And what we want to do is calculate the uh, uh, force here in the tangential direction. So the normal force is uh, this component, and then the tangential component, the sum of the forces in the tangential direction, F sub t, which is the negative, uh, the y direction, as kind of illustrated here, is just going to be negative F sub k, which is negative mu sub k times n, because it's slowing down. That is equal to the mass times the tangential acceleration, and that is m times dv by dt. So a little bit of a hint, there's some calculus coming. Okay, so now we've done all the physics. It's finished. We've written down our equations. We can solve uh, some, uh, we can solve them. So let's actually do that. So I just said, that the dv by dt times mass was equal to negative mu k times the normal force, which is negative mu k times the square root of the horizontal component squared plus the vertical component squared. And then that is equal to negative mu k times mv squared over it's too messy even for me. mv squared over r, that's the horizontal component squared, plus the vertical component squared, which is mg quantity squared. That is equal to m times dv by dt. So the first thing I want to do is I want to factor out an m squared from the radical, because then that gives me uh, minus mu k times square root of v to the fourth over r squared plus g squared and then a mass comes out times m is m times dv by tt and i can get rid of that pesky mass it's done Ooh, i typically like to do that in red to show that that's not actually part of my writing huh? fantastic so then i end up with an expression uh, that says dv by dt is equal to negative mu k times the square root of v to the fourth. I'm actually going to pull out a r squared from this. I'll square root of r squared it gives me an r underneath. And so I get a v to the fourth plus g squared r squared inside my radical. Okay. So at this point, I could go ahead and solve this to figure out what dv by dt is, integrate both sides with respect to time, all that, just what I did uh, with the fluid drag. But I'm going to use a slightly different technique, because once upon a time, back in lecture, part one, I made the assertion that v dot dv is equal to a dot ds. Okay. So what I will do is I'll use this expression as a start, and I will actually use this expression as the acceleration. Uh, and so that has an expression there for just uh, v's and co constants in the problem. So I will substitute that in, and I will solve for ds. So I will get uh, divide both sides by a. So I get ds is equal to v dv dv all over a, and so then that's going to give me the expression that uh, v dv, so that's uh, equal to v dot dv is equal over the square root of negative mu k over r times the square root of v to the fourth plus g squared r squared. Okay, and then that's ds, so I can integrate both sides, so I can integrate from zero to my final s ds is equal to the integral from where I start in speed, that's v naught, and where I finish, which is zero, 
and that's uh, negative r over mu k using the rules of compound fractions times the integral uh, times v dot dv over the square root of v to the fourth plus g squared r squared. And then I'm going to do a little bit of manipulation. So I'll pull out this part here. That's a constant. So I will pull it out in front of my integral. So that's negative r over mu k integral from v0 to 0 of v dot dv over v to the fourth plus g squared r squared. Now g squared r squared has units of velocity to the fourth as well. Uh, so what I can do is uh, sort of recognize that this integral is all kind of dimensionally uh, looking, oh, there's a square root. Now it's looking dimensionally great because it's the square root of v to the fourth. And then on top, v has units of uh, velocity and dv has units of velocity. So this means that I'm gonna be fine if I consider the velocities of the two. Um, Oh, or it's, uh, it's, I'm going to be fine because this whole expression in here is going to be dimensionless. Sorry, this whole expression in here will be dimensionless. And then I have an answer that is just the length, r over uh, mu k. Okay, so now I can sort of start uh, ca uh, calculating things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to recognize, and uh, that's the key part of math. I'm going to start out by doing s, uh, the integral on the right side, which just is sf minus zero, or so the final distance uh, that it travels is negative mu over uh, r, sorry, r over mu k. And then this integration here, I mean, I could just plug this into Wolfram alpha or something. Uh, but, you know, a perfectly uh, reasonable thing to do at this point is to try uh, to find another variable that I am going to try to, you know, do my calculations with respect to. And so uh, basically a u substitution. So I'm going to look for a variable u, and I'm going to set that to be equal to b squared over g times r. And then if I do that, then du is going to be equal to... Two uh, du is going to be two v. Sorry, du by dv is du is going to be two v over g times r because that's just the constant. Or du is just going to be two g over r times uh, v dot dv. And so if I make that substitution, I'm going to factor out that root g over uh, the g squared r squared. I'm going to factor that out. And I'm going to get that this whole thing is just the integral from v naught to zero. And then I'm going to pull out that g squared r squared. So uh, I'm going to get uh, v dot dv over gr, because I take the square root of it, times one over the square root of v to the fourth over g squared r squared plus one. Uh, and then I'm going to look at this up here, my v squared over gr, and recognize that that is just my u squared. Uh, and so we get minus r over mu k times v naught over zero uh, times uh, v dot dv over g times r times the square root of u squared plus one. And so then this expression uh, just keep simplifying, mu over rk, I recognize now that this vdv over gr, it looks a lot like my du, I just need an extra factor of 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply and divide by 2, so this is 0 uh, to v naught of 2v dot dv over gr times 1 over the square root of u squared plus 1. Okay, uh, we have done a little bit of running out of room, so I will grab the current mathematics here. I will copy. I will bring in another page, and then we will put that math in here. Okay, uh, so then, uh, as I said, and as I said, this is negative r over 2 mu k 
times uh, du over the square root of u squared plus 1 from v naught down to 0. And if I do that integral, uh, this is something where I do have to go and look up an expression or be very good at calculus. Uh, I will know that this answer is r over 2 times mu k times altogether the natural log of u uh, squared plus 1 plus u. And so that expression, when I take the derivative of it, will get back to my 1 over u squared plus 1. Let me neaten this up just a smidge. Natural log. There we are. Now I can do my substitutions, uh, recalling that I have done a u substitution here where u is equal to v squared over R G, and I can calculate my uh, values by uh, uh, carry out this integral. I should actually be precise and say I'm going from v naught to zero. So this is going to give me an answer here uh, that says this is r over two mu k, and then when I stick in at zero, uh, this goes to the natural log of zero squared plus one. The natural log of one is zero. And then the uh, u in that case is also zero. So I get an answer that's zero for sub a zero minus the natural log of v to the fourth, v naught to the fourth over rg, uh, r squared g squared plus one minus, because I have to distribute the negative sign in there, v naught squared over r g uh, as my values. And then I have the r over 2k and the negative sign out front. So my final speed is equal to r over, or the final distance I travel is r over 2 mu k uh, times the natural log of v naught to the fourth over r g plus 1 minus v naught squared over rg. And then I can plug in all my values and I get that this is 0 0.1 meters. This is 2 times 0.3, the coefficient of friction, times the natural log of the initial speed, which was 4 meters per second to the fourth over 0 0.1 uh, meters times 10 meters per second squared secretly chosen to always cancel out, uh, plus one minus, same answer, four meters per second squared over 0 0.1 meters times 10 meters per second uh, quantity, or seconds squared, uh, subtract off. So this is four to the fourth uh, plus one, natural log, this is, uh, this whole mess goes to 16, this mess goes to the natural log of 4 to the 4th plus 1. And then we get that uh, uh, these values over here. And when we work out and substitute in, in our calculator, we get an answer of about 0 0.6 meters. So this all covers basically a bunch of mathematics. Uh, and it sort of illustrates some techniques that once you get better with integrals, uh, you're kind of able to solve them. But the key part, and I'll just sort of come back to this again, is the physics. And I just want to highlight that the friction force here depends on the three-dimensional realization of the problem and the two components of the normal force. How do I know? I tried to solve it without the second component of the normal force and kept having my bead move forever. So don't do that. Uh, you need both components of the normal force to get this solved. All right. That's uh, what I wanted to say uh, here today. Uh, so these are some force models and some uh, examples illustrating mathematical technique and some of the basic physics principles. So we're done. Uh, have a great time. I will see you all later.